Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. With just a few days left before the midterm elections, will Americans decide to punish the Democrats or the Republicans? Let's get to the bottom line. Every two years, Americans get their chance to clean out all 435 elected members of Congress and start all over again. But most of the time, they just re-elect the same folks. But some races, well, they're genuinely competitive, and every cycle brings some fresh faces. What could really shake things up, though, next week is the party that controls the most seats in the House of Representatives. Two years ago, it leaned Democrat. This time, most polls are pointing to a Republican red wave taking over. The Senate, well, that's been evenly split, and both parties are working hard to flip a handful of seats in their favor. Even flipping one seat for either party makes a huge difference. For President Biden, well, it's sort of a referendum on his popularity, which is not so hot right now. If his party loses control of either House of Congress, the Senate or the House, it'll make it almost impossible for him to pursue his agenda anymore. Republicans are focusing on inflation, crime, and immigration. Democrats on abortion rights, Donald Trump, and a functioning democracy. So what'll it be? Today we're talking with Grover Norquist, a longtime Republican activist who founded Americans for Tax Reform, which argues for smaller government, and Amy Dacey, a veteran Democratic activist who was the CEO of the Democratic National Committee during the 2016 election and currently heads the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics at American University. Thank you both for joining me. Let me just start out with you, Amy, and say, you know, we're a few days away from this, and what I want our uh, watchers to get a feel for is what's on the dashboard of the voter day. What, what do you see? And you know, we've got Republicans and Democrats. We also have, frankly, a lot of independents that are out there. Absolutely. But what do you think are the big drivers right now, the passions, the anxieties that Americans are feeling? All right, this is crunch time. For anybody who's an operative and done this seven days out, we have had 23 million people already vote, early vote. So that small group that we're, you know, everybody's trying to scramble to on election day is important. So, you know, in these key races, I think a lot of it's turnout. I mean, to have two former presidents and, and a current president all go to the same state to try and make sure that as many of their voters are, are getting out is important. And this is the time where, you know, these uh, candidates are making their last minute plea to say, we're, I'm the answer. I, I'm, you know, on these issues, on the things you care about, I'm the solution for some of your biggest problems today. And so this is what's happening. Now, they're sm it's, it's smaller than you would think. Like you mentioned, out of 434, you know, five races in the House, really to only have 30 districts, you know, in play speaks a lot about our democracy and, and, you know, you know, the competitiveness across the country. But, you know, I think, as you said, it's about, listen, it's, it's not just the issues that matter, it's issues that motivate. I think all issues mm. matter. I don't think Democrats don't care about the economy or don't care about inflation. It's what's going to motivate them and get them to the polls. And this is what candidates, their teams, and their, you know, people on the ground are trying to figure out in these final days. Grover, I pay a, a lot of attention to polls. Maybe I shouldn't because pollsters are often so wrong. But one of the things I look at is that, you know, weekly or monthly, you see things rise. For a while, it was a Supreme Court decision on abortion really dented this country. Now you see inflation, the costs of just surviving and, you know, gas at the pump, food at the grocery store uh, is certainly an economic anxiety. Crime, the border. And I'm just interested as you talk, not just to the people you know out there, but as you kind of take a snack, because I know you're both, you're, we're all junkies for this stuff. What do you think right now are the passions that are driving a lot of Americans that will be defining in this election? Political parties and uh, consultants and the establishment press all like to think that they can shape the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been efforts. Early on, there was an effort to say this is all about Roe v. Wade. And that lasted until it wasn't. And for our, for our audience, Roe v. Wade <clears throat> is abortion. Yeah. It's the abortion it, issue. Whether, the Supreme, whether abortion will be dealt with at the state level or through the courts. Uh, and so there was an effort to make that the issue. Um, and the, the challenge is... When people walk by or drive by the gas station or many gas stations every day, that's like a paid political advertisement to say, Biden and the Democrats brought you higher gasoline prices. Before them, it was someplace else. And the same thing with inflation in general when you go to the grocery store. So you have an effort by the Republicans who might want to, oh, we'd like this to be about this or the Democrats about that. The rise in crime, which has been taking place in, across the country, the day-to-day -day assault of uh, inflation, wages growing slower than inflation, and the collapse of people's life savings in 401ks and IRAs. Those have forced themselves onto the agenda, even though smart people go, well, you should care about this, or the press says you should be obsessed with this. 
People make up their own mind, and those issues that matter are cutting against the D's this time, and that's the challenge, the headwinds mm -hmm. the Democrats face. Can I ask you a question, though, Grover, about the gas price issue, and I've thought about it, is, is the question of, do you expect the American public just to sort of be simple and say, okay, gas prices are rising, that's the fault of the president, or is it the fault of Vladimir Putin? Is it the fault of a, uh, an agent in the world that is weaponizing energy and creating that sort of dynamic? And if anything, the release of strategic uh, oil reserves and others was a response to that. I guess my question is, I know that the complexity of the strategic oil reserve is there and that Americans may not see that, that reflected in the price in the way they want, but I'm just interested in do we have to dumb everything down for an American voter? Or do you, do you tell them that there are certain points where the world is complex? You know, we've got climate change. We have, you know, a guy invading another country, and that stuff matters. I'm just sort of interested in depth. Well, I mean, politically, going back to Clinton and Gore, the modern Democratic Party's goal is to raise the price of gasoline and home heating oil and coal so that to force people to use more expensive alternatives. So to raise the cost of energy, I mean, this, this is their stated goal. When the Secretary of Energy was asked, what's your plan to reduce the cost of energy? She laughed in the face of the journalist. We don't have one, you idiot. Our plan is to raise the cost of energy. And the left has an interesting view of why that's a smart idea. <clears throat> the American people have a hard time understanding why it's a good idea. And if you ask them what you're willing to pay for, for climate change, it's a much smaller number than they've already been asked to pay for. So. The, the two parties are different. One wants mm -hmm. low-cost, abundant energy. Trump was always talking about fracking and so on. And the other is looking to shut down fracking and drilling and make America less independent, mm -hmm. which gives you Putin and other people being in charge of the cost of energy. Why is there not a greater sense that everybody's on the same boat, even if they have to wrestle over policy differences? Well, listen, elections are about contrast. Governing is yeah. about consensus. Mm. So when you're you're in the middle of an election, it is about a, about do you share our values? You know, do you share our opinions on these things? Um, I don't think the Democratic Party is in the business of trying to make life harder for people. And maybe their long-term strategy is something that they're looking at as right. opposed to what the Republicans are. But I think this toxicity, this it's it's I, I think it's having less competitive places, having less conversation. I think in an interesting way, these razor-thin margins in places. Um, should we have these, uh, we call them trifectas, where the governor's office, the state senate, and the state house are all of the same party? Having a diversity of ideas in the power structure can only help with that. Now, we recently did a poll um, at the Sign Institute that looked at impressions for 18 to 34-year-olds, and this could be generational, too. There seems to be there's areas that they do seek more consensus on. And, in fact, the most striking thing that came out of that poll is that they think if they work together, they can actually solve some Younger of folks Younger folks are more consensus-oriented. That's new for me. Yes. Well, I mean, this is why we wanted to, you know, look into the poll and say that they, they, you know, they don't necessarily trust the institutions that exist now. They don't think the current power structure allows them to change. But they think if they band together that they can, and they think that that's important. Now, there's still a lot of differences between even young, you know, Republicans and Democrats. But here's the other thing that I think is huge and what both parties have to look at. There's an anger, there's an anxiety, there's an angst out there, and you have to tap into that. You have to say that you understand that that's the situation, and how are you the better party then to, to, to answer that? But the other thing is, I, I think sometimes we suffer from, on both sides of the aisle, is you have to be, you can't just be against something, you have to be for something. And so a lot of these candidates in the final days, they, they should be able to, to reflect that. Um, and and my, my final thought on that, which I'm very, getting very concerned about, is that we're electing people who think the day after they're elected that they only represent the people that voted for them. You know, once they're elected, they represent their constituency. And so I think we have to have conversations. They have to be more open to, to look at a lot of different, you know, variations um, when they come to the table. And hopefully people are rewarded um, rather than chastised if they reach across the aisle to have some of those conversations. Grover, take your Republican hat off for a minute. Just be, you know, sharp, like, you know, what would you do to help Biden? Biden is about 42.3 percent approval, which is low, you know, as you're kind of, you know, at this moment. But, I mean, he was in the 30s before. Donald Trump was in the 30s. So we want to be careful uh, that others have been uh, in, this, in this level and have come back. But, and, and the disapproval, though, is, a, is always a harsher number, up about 54 percent. Why, when you've had uh, infrastructure passed and you had support in the American Recovery Act passed and you had the CHIPS Act passed that was basically about American competitiveness, um, you had the student loan forgiveness yeah. program passed, why, from your perspective, 
are his numbers so low? Not as a Republican. And if you were advising this president and his team on how to do better, sure. what would you advise them to do? Don't do any of the four things he did. Um, if you ask people how they feel about having their money taken to pay 14 percent of the public, many of whom are graduate school students who are going to be much richer than them all their lives, is that a good idea? No, it's a bad idea, and it's an unpopular idea, which mm. is why they don't talk about it uh, very much. The idea that we should do give money to people to build chips here instead of somewhere else is it's been tried all throughout the world it leads to argentina this 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 not having international competition and and having the government make these decisions japan suffered greatly for having exactly that strategy that didn't work um, the other one is the the massive tax and spending program which hasn't even completely hit in on the taxes yet but you see the stock market and people's life savings way down as a result of those Bills. Passing bills, if they do bad things, is not a helpful thing to do. <laughs> um, he didn't focus on the things he said he was going to focus on, or he didn't do the things he said he was going to focus on, and that's been expensive. He should go talk to his base because they still like him. Amy, your thoughts on that as well, and, and, and one little add on this, you know, when I, I listen to my friends in the progressive side. The issue that's palpable for them is this sense that American democracy is dying, we're fading away and crumbling. There's a lot of focus on Donald Trump um, as an illiberal autocrat about the January 6th um, attack uh, on Congress. And so I guess my question is, does maintaining a democratic uh, rules-based country get out voters? I mean, I think it's important. Again, I'll go back to it might be an important issue for people, but I, I believe I agree with Grover. If, you, if you're faced with, you know, um, challenges for your, your family, for cost of living, what you, you know, need for, to make sure that, that you're able to meet basic needs, good paying jobs, that's something that, you know, could become at the forefront. And it's not to say you don't care about it, but it's about, like, when I'm going to vote and my vote matters, I want to make sure that I'm investing, you know, for a future that's good for me and my family. Mm. So I think candidates, Democrats, you know, uh, are, are figuring out ways to do this, you know, as well as Republicans, about how do we then share with them that, that we're, the, we're the ones who are going to bring you down that path. Mm. It, it's interesting. You, you look at a race like mm. Wyoming. I mean, that became, you know, for, for Liz Cheney, this, this uh, litmus test on democracy in a sense. And in an interesting way, I, I watched for a little while the, the debate um, between, you know, uh, the two opponents who are vying for this, you know, congressional, to get through this congressional primary. And there wasn't a lot said about what they were going to do for Wyoming or what, you know, was mm. going on. So I think these matters of democracy, we have a shared responsibility, both Democratic um, and Republicans, to care about this and certainly to, to say there is a problem with January 6th and how are we going to do this. There, there are two things happening. One is during the lifetime of Ronald Reagan, uh, the two parties separated out along issues of principle. There used to be Republicans who would raise taxes. There used to be Democrats who would cut taxes. There used to be Republicans who would steal your guns. There used to be Democrats who wouldn't steal your guns. That's gone, okay? The Democrats ran the last pro-life uh, person out of, of office. Doesn't exist, you know, talk to the Catholics. You know, so you've got two competing forces where, where being a Republican means something on all the key issues. Being a Democrat means something on the key issues. Go back to the 1950s and 60s, there were Southern Democrats who were conservatives and there were Northern Republicans who were liberals. That's sorted out. The two parties are principled parties. And so there's going to be much more partisan. And all mm. disagreements are partisan. Disagreements before weren't partisan. They were ideological, but they weren't partisan mm. before. The second part is the two parties are fairly evenly split. Mm. Okay? I mean, this is a huge difference. For, from 1932 to 1994, when the Republicans captured the House and Senate, the Republicans... Uh, we were elected to control Congress for four of 62 years. Mm. They weren't players, okay? They were the Washington generals, and they never got to win, ever. And so you had a one-party state in Congress, which runs America. Presidents come and go. They can start wars, but that's about it. Otherwise, Congress runs America. They raise taxes. They do spending. From 94 on, which I point out is when the Republicans all signed the pledge never to raise taxes mm -hmm. and kept that promise as the party that won't raise taxes, They've won Congress 60% of the time. Hmm. Never to 60%. If you're a Democrat, your idea of democracy is complete. Democracy means we run the House and we run everything. All of a sudden, they have to struggle to have a say in running government the way they used to do it for 62 years uninterrupted in terms of Congress. Now they have Congress less often than not, and they're about to lose it again, perhaps. So 
there's a lot of angst there, right. and people say there's no democracy when they mean my team's not winning. Mm. So is, is, is the country so polarized, polarized right now mm -hmm. that most folks are just going to vote party line votes? And, and, and if, and if no, no matter who's running the franchise of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, mm -hmm. and where are independents right now? What, what are, you know, because I, the last time I looked, uh, independents still account for more Republicans or Democrats, you know, self defined. I'm just sort of interested the in this party, squishy independent the world. The party whose main issues carry the independents wins. Hmm. Okay? You got to carry your base, but you got to convince the independents that the issues you're running on matter. So some of the issues. Abortion and January 6th are fine for the Democratic Party. Do they win you independence? The Republicans go, we want to keep your energy costs low. We want you to have more money. We want your 401k to matter. That's a, that's a better sell for independence. So riling up your base is one thing, but who wins the independence wins the game. To what degree, Amy, are we seeing a precursor of the 2024 presidential race? So we're in midterm races. Where basically, you know, every uh, uh, almost all these different local and you know state level seats are up, and you know all the House seats and one third of the Senate, but not the presidency. But is this a litmus test basically for the 2024? Whether it's Biden and Donald Trump, yeah. is it going to be somebody like Biden and someone like Donald Trump in 2024? So, and that's what we're seeing as yeah, the I early think 2024 four shots is. Of like underneath in the the underneath conversation for everything. You, these are not two separate elections in a lot of respects because I think presidential politics is like chess. You make one move because the next two moves are going to get you, you know, maybe where you want to go. So a, a lot is, you know, put on the line. I think you have somebody like a DeSantis down in Florida who would say if he does really well in the election, does that position him in a different way for a 2024, you know, um, structure? If, if uh, Democrats lose, you know, the House and the Senate, what does that say about, you know, how they position themselves for the next hmm. you know, national election? I, I think the question is, too, is like, you know, you're going to have a lot of new members of Congress, you know, in some of these districts across the country, and how will that, you know, influence a national election that's coming? Um, but there's so many factors that come into play for a presidential. And, and again, just seeing how we, you know, go through to figure out who the nominees are. And I'll go back to something, um, Grover, that you, you kind of mentioned. I think the other big challenge is the independents get to decide a lot in a general election, but they're not deciding who those candidates are that go on the ballot for the general election. Mm -hmm. We both have a problem in the parties, I think, where we're seeing smaller entities decide who our nominees are in these in these things. And party affiliation, as that decreases and goes away, that, that can be challenging for both sides because what are the candidates that are getting on the ballot in the general and are they representing the values of the party and are they somebody that an independent can um, align themselves with? Steve, for your international audience, mm. everyone looks at the Congress and the president. That's vaguely interesting. They're going to be locked like this, mm. accomplishing very little in terms of moving the country one way or the other. Right. 50 states are having elections, 50 governors, 7,000 state legislators. And right now, the Republicans control most of the governorships and 30 of the state legislatures, okay? Mm. They have been shifting the playing field over the last several years, passing school choice across the country, once considered a dramatic issue. Homeschooling used to be a go to prison issue back in 1986 in 48 states. Now it's legal everywhere. Private schools are legal everywhere and school choice is expanding everywhere. The Second Amendment, now once really beaten up, now at the states, 45 states have passed laws that you could have a concealed carry permit if you want to. 27 mm -hmm. states, you don't need a permit. You can carry if you want to. So on these, and taxes, you've got a whole series of 24 states, red states, cut taxes over the last several years. And you've got uh, five states voted to go to a single rate tax, not a progressive mm -hmm. tax, a single rate tax. And Illinois, Democrat state wanted to go to a progressive tax. That was voted down. Mm. Massachusetts about to have a vote for the sixth time. Should we go to a progressive income tax? That, if that passes, mm. that's it. very interesting. If it fails, it's the sixth time liberal Massachusetts has said no to a central tenet of the modern Democrat Party. Well, let me ask you both quickly. Um, some people have characterized this almost in the way that you did generationally, that there are generational changes and also racial divides in the country. And I'd love you to tell me where this equation is wrong, where youth, the youth and those of color vote for the Democratic Party, the elder whites in America vote for the Republican Party, and they seem to be doing well. But what does that not account for in terms of the dynamism of the modern you know, political yeah, establishment? These groups aren't monoliths. 
Right. So um, we can't look at the Hispanic community as having all the same. A lot of people do. A lot of people want to say that the Hispanics are with the Democrats. But if you look at the shift. This, Hispanics, yeah. African Americans, women, they're persuadable voters. Mm. And you can't, you know, you can say base voters, like, there's, they're not a monolith. You have to go to them and, and talk about the values that you have, the issues that you want, what, what, how you can make their lives better. And I think that's the big challenge. Even young voters, um, you know, a, a young college age, you know, voter who decides to go to college versus somebody who um, doesn't, you know, right. these are all, um, differences within these groups and I think sometimes we treat them like a monolith and that's a big mistake and we have to think about how we're, we're communicating with Grover? them. Grover? Central, central mistake of the Democratic Party over the last 40 years is to treat Mexican Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, Cuban Americans, you're all Hispanic or then they give them new names. A bunch oh. of white professors go, we think we'll call you Latinx and take that. We'll tell you what to do and what to think. They did that to the black community for years and that's getting tiresome and the Hispanic community is breaking free step by step, ethnic group by ethnic group, state right. by state. The, the, Spani the, the Hispanic vote, the people whose parents spoke Spanish, that vote is different in every state, not just among ethnicities. Um, and the Democrats were building this sandcastle with something that didn't, wasn't going to stay there. Grover, what was the book you wrote a few years ago, the title of the book? And it leave basically said, keep your hand, leave us alone. Uh, it was gun, God, and, and uh, guns, God, and taxes. Actually, God uh, wasn't there. But, uh, oh, God was not there. What were the three? Keep your hands off our, uh, our money and our, ta and our guns. Money and, and, and guns. Uh, and, I, and I sort of think that that was a very interesting thing for me because I'm just wondering, it was a sort of a, you know, a libertarian uh, ethic there, and you kind of look back and say, well, on one hand, what Grover wrote has really was prescient, but at the same time, you see a lot of Republicans wanting to federalize their views. It used to be states' rights. Are, are, are we going to see a battle within the Republican Party, a divide over when you have authority from the above, forcing everyone to do certain? How, how's that going to go? You have a bunch of in intellectuals who are unhappy that they have no original thoughts that they want to sell, but you, you have those guys over, some Republicans who want, right. I have a new theory, ooh, black, that'll be great. No, it won't. Um, and we deal with this all the time that people want to come mm. up and have a new theory right. of the universe. In point of fact, the modern Republican Party, the conservative movement, is made up of groups that on their vote-moving issue, not all mm. issues, their vote-moving issue, not libertarians, but on their vote-moving issue, they want to be left alone, whether it's their faith mm. or their guns or their kids' education or their money or their life savings or their taxes or not wearing helmets or not getting shots or something, you know, whatever, it, leave me alone, then you're in. And that, and that is a coalition that holds together because there's no conflict on a vote moving mm. issue. When you try and bring the other stuff in, could we steal money from him and give it to me? No, 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 no. Then you're pushing people out of the circle. Sorry. Well, we'll have to end it there. Grover Norquist, president of Americans for Tax Reform, yeah. and Amy Dacey, executive director of the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics at American University. Really great discussion. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? On one level, these elections are about two very different visions for America's future, one defined by Donald Trump and one defined by Joe Biden. But that's not necessarily what's on Americans' minds when they go to vote. They're thinking about their wallets, and they see crime everywhere. Some feel that America's border with Mexico is out of control. Others feel they have to save democracy or stop Trump or stop Biden at all costs. And some are motivated by women's rights, the climate, or racism, or all of the above. Each party is trying to figure out what the voters' anxieties are, and they're promising to fix it. On another level, they're already thinking about the 2024 elections, where some sort of Trump-like figure will face off against some sort of Biden-like figure, if not those two themselves. But for now, this crazy mix of fear, hope, and promises is the name of the game, at least for a few more days. And that's the bottom line.